guys, Galatians chapter number 4, and uh, we're going to go back here one more time into verse number 4, and uh, this is our, tis the season and the fourth lesson, and uh, we will uh, kind of wrap this up this morning on Christmas Day, or the day after Christmas, sorry, next year I think Christmas is on Sunday, isn't it, so we'll have potlucks and everything going on, I'm just kidding, oh, what, you know, so anyway, Galatians 4 verse number 4. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And we've been looking at that uh, passage over the last three weeks, and I did so because the, our apostle here, Paul, he says, Hey, when the fullness of time was come, God the Father sent forth God the Son, made of a woman and made under the law. And I wanted to look at that with you so that you could see that even, you know, when Paul talks here, he, he's not, he doesn't discount the birth of Christ. He rather says, listen, the world's going to be worshiping the birth. We rejoice in his death. If you come to, you're in Galatians, look over at chapter 6. While the world is, is celebrating his birth, we need to be celebrating his death, burial, and resurrection. Galatians 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul says, we preach Christ, how? Crucified. So when you think about this time of the year, and I, and I understand family tradition, I'm all for it. Linda and I, we have... The Jordan family tradition has always been Christmas Eve, go walk the mall. And when Fiesta Mall was open, we lived nearby, we would go and we would unload. And here we go, me, Linda, the stroller full of the kids, and we would walk the mall. And you'd think, you're nuts. But see, we were done. We were enjoying the, the show. And usually it was dads running around, dragging the kids. What, you think mom would like this? You know, and so we just, Linda and I have just carried it on as our kids have gotten older and moved out and are on their own. They don't hold such traditions anymore. So, but we do, and we were out the other night. So I'm for family traditions. There's nothing wrong with them. The, the thing is, is don't forget about Christ. Use the opportunity to talk about Christ. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you will. So, if we think about Galatians 4, 4, while you're going to 1 Timothy, he was, when the fullness of time was come, the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father right on time. No wiggle room, no movement this way or that, right on time. He was sent in the right manner. He was made of a woman. And that we looked at that issue of the seed of the woman and how, hey, how is he coming? He has to come this way. You know, God the Father could have just said, son, step right down there on Mount Ararat and you're in. You know, but he didn't do that because prophecy, the word of God, the word of the Father said he's coming this way. He was going to be born of a virgin. He was going to be born in a little town called Bethlehem. He was going to come right here. He was for unto us this night, a son is given, and he was going to do all of that. So he came in the right manner, and he came in the right program. He was made under the law. Eight days, they're up circumcising. They're up in the temple. They're doing the days of uh, Mary's purification, Luke 2. They're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. When the wise men come several years later, when they get there and they come in, they go to Herod and the chief priest. Where is king of the Jews. So they're in the right program. But Paul, when you come to you and I today, we see that. And again, I, I'm all for, you know, family tradition, things you do, culture. But look at 1 Timothy 1.15. Notice what Paul says. Why did, in Matthew 1.21, he's going to call his name Jesus, for he shall what? Save his people from their sins? Now, Paul, 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to what? To save sinners, of whom I am chief. Save who? Sinners. See, how Paul says, don't miss, his coming is good. His coming is legitimate. By the way, there's one Savior. There's one. And what Paul's going to press home 
in several passages is the, the Savior, the Messiah of Israel is now our Savior as well. So one guy, he died, Hebrews says what? Once for all. There's no two-way cutting on him. There's no second cross. There's no every, you know, the Roman Catholic idea of mass, and here he is again. There's none of that. He did it one time. And when Paul says, hey, for the faithful saying is that what? Christ Jesus came into the world to what? Save sinners. Israel's program, just dealing with Israel first. Why? Because their program, Israel has to be right and ready and that royal priesthood, that holy nation, and then they're going to go to the Gentiles. Today in the age of grace, what's Paul say? The mediator between man and God is who? The man, Christ Jesus. That means he had to be what? Born. He had to be a man. That's who he was. So when the Lord, when the Father hatches that plan, look back at with me at uh, Ephesians. Well, go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. You can stick something in Philippians 2 because this is where we're going to be. What I would like to do the rest of the morning is just kind of talk to you from my heart here. When the Lord, if you think about what the Father was doing, Galatians 4.4, His eternal plan and purpose, Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 8, it's called wisdom. And He's working that plan out. He's proclaiming it. He's revealing it. We see his thinking. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. But it's interesting to look at how the Lord was thinking. What was the Lord thinking when he said, this is what you're going to do? Look at Philippians 2 and look at verse number 5. Look at when, when the Lord left heaven's glory and came to be born of a virgin in a little town of Bethlehem to be right where he was to be. Philippians 2, verse number 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So there is a thinking process. There's a thinking scenario that as he stands there, and as he sees the Father's plan, Ephesians 1 calls it the plan of glory, laid out before him, before the foundation of the world, and eternity passed in the council room of the Godhead. They have a conference room. They get together, and he's standing there, verse 5. He says, hey, this is how he was thinking. So how was he thinking? Well, go back up to verse 2, Philippians 2, 2. Look at how the Godhead thinks. If Paul's telling you and I to have this mindset... The mindset, verse 5, let this mind be in you. Well, okay. Well, prior to that, he just laid out a mindset. Verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be, what? Like-minded. Having the same love. Being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's how the Godhead thinks. Uh, The Godhead, three persons, three individual distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How do they interact with each other? Verse 2. What are they? Like-minded. They have what? The same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. They're not trying to outdo the other. They're actually doing the opposite. They are lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You see, that's the mindset that Christ had. I don't know if you ever kind of, I have a vivid imagination. And imaginations are wonderful because unless they're founded in the truth of God's word, what are they? Just dreams and wishes. You think about, I thought about verse 2 and 3. That's how the Godhead thinks about each other. And when he says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, when Christ comes and he's born and he does the earthly ministry, and then he comes over here and he does for you and I in the age of grace, reveals all of that progressive revelation, he's going to be demonstrating 
before man what man should have always been doing since Adam and Eve. Well, how do you look at verse 6? How do you, just, let's just look at his thinking. The, by the way, the Godhead, God. Three individual persons make up the Godhead. The essence of deity, the essence of God. And I know, I break out the theological books. You don't have to. Think about, I think about it this way. I, illustr- I try to illustrate it this way. Think about, everybody in this room is human. We're all what? One blood, Act says. We're all humanity, aren't we? If I cut my finger, I bleed. If you cut your finger, you bleed. But we always do what? Heal back up usually, right? We're all human. But aren't we all different? We've got young. We've got old. We've got bald. We've got getting there. And we got full head of hair, right? We all have different experiences. We all, but what are we? We have the essence of human. The Godhead's the same way. They have an essence of God, of deity, in what? Three distinct persons. That's why the Holy Spirit can grieve. He can be sad. That's why the Lord, when he's God, he's not weary. But when he's made man, he's worn out, gets worn out from time to time. In our study in Mark on Wednesday night, we just looked at the, that, that storm in Mark 4 where he crawls in the ship and he puts his head, and Mark calls it, he laid his head down on a pillow. Now, the other ones just say he laid down, but Mark says he laid down on a pillow. You know what you do when you lay down on a pillow? You're at complete rest, aren't you? You're sunked out. Anyway, verse 6. I told myself, I got it right here. Don't get distracted. Look at verse 6. Who is the Lord? 2-6. Who, so Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Who is he? He's God. He's John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Who is full of grace and truth. Who is he? He's God. He has no problem being God. He's the second member of the Godhead. And Jesus Christ knew that he was not going to take anything away from the other members of God by going and doing the will and the word of the Father. The Father's got a plan. It's called glory. And a component of the plan is the activity of the Son. Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10, the central figure of the plan of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, i got to go do some things. Hold on to Philippians. Flip back to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Some of this will be on your handouts, or on the overhead, but most of it will be on your handout, I hope. 2 Corinthians 8. The overhead gets to be too tight, so we have to cut some. 2 Corinthians 8. Look at verse number 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're reading about in Philippians 2. The original grace thinker. We'll see that in just a minute. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was what? Who is he? He's God. He's rich. And over there in John, he says, Father, bring me back to the glory I had with you before all of this stuff started. Get me back. I want to be back up there. But not my will, but thy will be done. We got stuff to do. Who, what was he? He is rich. He had a reputation, by the way. What's his reputation? Son of God. Son of the living God. Son of, you know, Christ. Here he is. He's got, he was, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor. That ye through his poverty might be rich. How did he become poor? Go back to Philippians 2. Watch him get poor. Watch him, he became, he took on the form of a servant. Philippians 2, 6, he thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. By the way, what, what is his reputation? We all want reputations. We always want to have a good reputation. What, what is that? What, a reputation is what people think and say about you. Well, what's his reputation? Who, he's God. But he made himself of what? 
by the way, he made himself. No one did this to him. He did it. In the plan, in the conference room, in the plan, the father said, son, this is what I'd like you to do. The son looked at it, studied it out, and he made a choice in his thinking, in the free will of his mindset. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. You know what, father, that's a great plan. Let's go do that. And can we do it now? Come on, come on, you know, boom. He get, you, you ever see that? You ever get excited about something? He's like, can we have it now? You know, it, it, yesterday was Christmas. I can remember when the kids were little, and they come out, they're jumping on the bed, 4.30 in the morning. I'm like, kid, you better get back in bed, and don't look down the hallway, you know? It's like, oh, four. now it's like, we'll be there by 11. Is that okay? I'm like, yes. You finally learned, right? No. What The excitement. Think about the Lord, the Godhead in that room, and the excitement by the Godhead as they watched the Father lay out his plan for creation and for the ultimate goal of who's going to rule and reign in the universe and to allow the creation, the creatures in the creation to run it and to do all of that that we've studied over the year. And the, father, the Son looks at that and he says, you know what, I'm going to make a choice in my own thinking to do this. And I'm going to esteem the Father's plan better than myself. So I'm not going to claim a reputation. Now, he never stops being God. We have a song that says, and it's a horrible song, part of the song, I should say, that says he emptied himself of all his deity. He didn't do that. He's still God. You know how you know that? Read the Gospels. He sits there and goes, I, I know what you're thinking. So I'm going to say this to you and watch you jump. And then, he climbs out of that boat. He comes up on that, in that Mark 4. He calms the sea, tells the wind to stop, and the, disciple, the people watching him there say, what manner of man is this? Because what do they know? Psalms says only God can do that. So then what is he? He's God. He looks over there and says, I forgive your sins. And they go, huh? He goes, only God can forgive your sins, Mark 2. He never stops being God. He just takes on also what? Humanity. 100%. What does he do, though? He made himself. Never forget the made himself. The father laid the plan out. The son chose to participate in the plan. That's what an adult does. Verse, Philippians 2, verse 7. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He took upon himself a form. He's talking about being in the shape of, the outward manifestation. Linda was making chocolate chip cookies the other night. They're still there, but in half a quantity now, okay? She took the dough. What'd she do? Put it all in there, there. get it ready. Put all the ingredients in there. Bag of chocolate chips, and I put a few more. Bag more, boom, bam. What she, she takes the scoop, goes over, scoops it. What are they in the form of? A ball of cookie dough. They go into the oven. They come out. What are they in the form of? Not a ball, but in a what? In a cookie. The form, the outward manifestation. He says, part of the, the Lord says, I'm going to participate in the plan, and the plan calls for me to take on the form of a servant, the outward manifestation of being willing and obedient to the word and the will of the Father. I'm going to do that. Form. In verse 8, he says, and being found in fashion as a man. <laughs> fashion show. I'm going to show man what a servant should look like. That's why the Lord, when he goes over and he washes the disciples' feet, and they get all mad at him. Peter's the one that gets mad at him. And he looks at Pete and he says, Pete, sit there, be quiet, let me do this, because you need to know what a servant looks like. 
because you're going to go be a servant. And in my kingdom, servants, service, being a servant is the issue. You and I today in the age of grace, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? He serves at the pleasure of the, lead, the commander of the foreign government. We're in foreign territory, folks. <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the enemy's territory. And what is our job? We're to proclaim, hey, not Christ was born, but what? Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. By the way, proclaiming the Calvary necessitates a what? A birth. You're not ignoring the birth. You're saying the more important is the death, burial, and resurrection. He took on the form. So the issue, come, come back with me to Isaiah. Whose servant is he? Because he's going to show man. Come back to Isaiah uh, 42. We'll go there. Isaiah 42. He's going to show man what a servant should look like. So then when man comes in and, and begins to learn and to grow and to do, he'll know what it, should, what it looks like, that outward manifestation. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Uh, Behold my servant whom I uphold. Behold who? My servant. Isaiah 42, 1. My servant. The Lord, the Father's talking about who? The Son. Well, how do you know that? Well, you go on down and you finish reading the passage there. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, there he is. Come over to Isaiah 53. Great chapter. We love Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And you just run your eye all down through there. Verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's Psalms 22. We'll get over there in just a minute. He shall see, he, the Father, shall see the soul, uh, see uh, of the travail of his soul, the Son, as he does what? Psalms 22 goes and hangs at Calvary and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Who are we talking about? Now, that's Israel's program. I got that context. But who's he talking about? He's, the Father's talking about the Son. And what is the Son going to do? He's going to come and be the Father's servant. Go and do. He took what the Father said. Come back to Philippians 2. He takes what the Father says. He takes his word. And then he puts himself in obedience to that word to the will of the Father. That's why all through the earthly ministry, especially there in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will. Could you imagine sitting there going, hey, Father, if there's a way for me not to go through the wrath, because I just looked into this cup of the wrath of your indignation without mixture, <laughs> is there a way that we can get through that? Don't you think the Father has stormed through everything to figure a loophole? But before the Father, think about, think about that. I just, before the Father can respond to the Son, the Son, the prayer in Gethsemane, not, not my, hey, is there a way for this cup to pass? Go read John. Go read this in Matthew. Before the Father can say no, the Son has already said what? Not my will, but thy will be done. The prayer was, is there a way for the cup to pass? Not my will, but thy will be done. The Father hasn't even responded yet. You see that? Why? Because the Son's not there to do the, His own bill. I've made myself of what? No reputation. I'm not going to be God. I'm not going to do what I want to do. You go look in John 8 and John 7 and John 10 and John 12 and Mark 2, and you read those passages and he says, I'm here doing the works of him that sent me. I'm here doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, what is he doing? Philippians 2 verse 8. And being found, I'm, I'm sorry, and was made in the likeness of men. <laughs> Don't miss that part. End of verse 7. Likeness of men. Come over to Romans 8. Real quick, Romans 8, the likeness of men. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 3. Romans 8, 3. 
for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Sending his son in the what? Likeness of. He's not, he's sinless. That's who he is. But he's in the what? The likeness of it. He's, in, he's got that picture. That's why the Lord would say, and Hebrews would say, he's tempted in all points common to man. And everybody goes, ah, but he didn't have the internet and he didn't have what we got. Yeah, he had worse. First John over there, he talks about the, First John 2. The love of love not the world, neither the thing. First John two fifteen and sixteen. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Do you know how man's tempted? All points, those three: the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You go read Matthew four. You go read Luke four. When the devil tempts the Lord, he tempts him in those three areas. When Satan visits Eve in the garden of in the garden of Eden, he gets her in those three areas. Do you know where he gets you? In the pride of life, knowledge, puffed up, pride, knowledge. No, lust of the eyes. I gotta have it. The lust of the flesh. The the desires there. And you know what he does? Boom. Eve. She saw the fruit, and she saw that it was good. And then she thought, saw that it brought her knowledge of the tree of good and evil. He's in the likeness of. Paul says there, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that he was made to be sin for us. He didn't know, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. That word made. That's to take something in its normal form and put it into an unnatural form. Your normal, natural form is a sinner. But he did what? He can make you into righteous. He takes the Lord Jesus Christ, who is righteous, and makes him into, boy, I'm getting ahead of myself, makes him into that worm. The sin. Philippians 2. Verse 8, and being found and fashioned as a man, fashion show, show it off. He humbled himself, being found and fashioned as a man. You know what he is? He's a man. There's only two men in the Bible, Adam and Christ. All those in Adam do what? Die. All those in Christ live. That's the only two people you got to worry about. Actually, that's the only place you need to worry about. Am I in Adam? If I am, I'm dead. If I'm in Christ, I'm what? Alive. People get all upset with Paul in Romans 15. He talks about those that were in Christ before me. Oh, okay. No, before me, why? Because no matter where you're at in Scripture, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ, period. That's where you're at. That's the basics. Job asked the question, Job 9, how is man just with God? You're in Adam, you're dead. You're in Christ, you're alive. He puts on a fashion show. Hebrews chapter 2. He becomes a man. He comes along. He's born of a woman. Natural birth. He comes out natural. They wrap him in swaddling clothes. By the way, the one song that we were singing there, I think it's Away in a Manger, says in that second verse something about, and he does not cry. That's a, that's a lie, because he's a naturally born child. What does a naturally born child do? They cry. Yeah, but Rick, he doesn't have a scent. He's not, I, I, okay, that's fine. Doesn't mean he doesn't cry. Here you are, you're in Christ. When you hit your hammer, you hit your finger with your hammer, what do you do? Didn't hurt, didn't hurt. No, you ah, you know. You go running into the wife, hey, fix it, fix it. Kiss it, make it better. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse 14. Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, talking about Jesus, by the way, verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels 
for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for a little lower than the angels. You know what he did when he was made in the likeness of and fashioned as? He took on the dirt man's status. But he's a servant. Angels are ministering spirits. They're servants. He took on the low class servant. He didn't take the high class. He took the low class. I was watching a documentary on High Clare Castle in, in England over there, and they were talking about the different stations of workers. He wasn't the head butler. He's the guy in the trough down there cleaning out the pigsty and the horse stalls. That's you. He took on you, verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same. What did he take part of? Flesh and blood. He became man. But why? That through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them. Verse 9, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of what? Death. He became man. He became in Scripture what is called the kinsman redeemer, the book of Ruth, the, back in Leviticus. He became kinsman redeemer, the law of the kinsman redeemer. First, you've got to be kin. That means he's got to be what? He's got to be man. He's got to be family. Then you've got to be able to perform the requirement. And the kinsman's part, it's usually redeeming some over here on the brother's side. But then you have to be willing. And you know what? His birth made him kin. He had already demonstrating that he was able to do it and that he was willing to do it. And that's what he's doing. That's why Romans 8, 3, sent in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh. So when you come back to Galatians or the Philippians 2, what's happening here? Paul says, look, guys, I want you, Philippians, you, Southwoods Bible Fellowship, you, Church, the Body of Christ, to have the same mindset, to have the mindset of considering others before you're esteeming others better than yourself, having the mindset of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, because look at what he does in verse 8. He humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death. He became what? Obedient. Could you imagine? Here is God the Son talking to God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the Father says, Son, you got to go die. And he goes, what is that? He's God. He's always been and always will be. The Alpha, the Omega, he's it. They don't know what death means or experience, but what did he say? He says, I'll go do it. On the basis of what? Your word. That you're going to do what with me? Resurrect me. On the basis of the Father's word that he would resurrect him, the Son says what? I'll go. I'm willing and I'm able. Uh, by the way, the able thing is fascinating. Come over to Matthew. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 53. He's in the garden. Well, we've got to get going here. He's in the garden. Matthew 26, 53. He's being betrayed. He's, uh, verse 49, uh, Judas Iscariot has kissed him. They've come to take him. Peter's pulled his sword. The servant, uh, verse 51 there, he took off, he's going for Malchus's head, took his ear instead. The Lord heals it. Verse 53, the Lord, the Lord says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Isn't that interesting? Peter, put away the sword. Don't you think that if I called to the Father, he would send 72,000 angels to my defense? A legion is roughly 6,000. There's 12 of them. Six is the high number, by the way. I just. I mean, could you imagine being able to speak and 72,000 angels show up? 
But watch verse 54. But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that thus it must be? You know what he's saying, Pete? Put away. I'm the only one that can fulfill the scripture because I'm, I'm the son. And I'm gonna, I got to go die. Well, come back to Philippians 2.8. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That end of verse 8, come over to Galatians 3, is not just any death. It is a cursed death. Galatians 3.13. He accomplishes, he, again, according to his own determination, his own thinking, his own free will choice, says, I'm going to go and do what the Father's will and word said for me to do in the plan called glory. I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to accomplish it, and that requires me to go die, and to go die the death of the cross. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That's Deuteronomy 21, where Moses says you're going to go stone the guy, you kill him, and then you hang him on a tree so everybody knows the activity is a curse. Don't do that. And you know what the son does? Come over to John 19. He goes right out there. And what does Israel do to him? If you're God, if you're the Lord, if you say who you are, come on down off of there. And they spit on him and they... Turn him over to Rome, John 19. They get him, and they beat, hey, I mean, they, he is so beat that they got to get a guy out of Rufus's dad to come out and to carry the cross for him. His visage is marred, the psalm says, the prophets say. John 19, look at verse 28. John 19, 28, he's gone through all of that. He's hanging, he's hung on the cow, he's on the cross. It starts in verse 16. John 19, 16. Uh, then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, and they crucified him. What did they do? They put him up there, they crucified him. A cursed death. The Lord st- hanging there, head erect, speaks from Calvary, from the cross, seven times. All seven is in fulfillment of a prophetic scripture that needed to be fulfilled. He gets all the way down to the end. Verse 28. And this, John 19, 28. And this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. What's he done? He's run. He's God. He's run every passage of the word of the Father. He looks over there in Luke 24 and he says, everything that Moses and the Psalms and the prophets talked about, I've done. I've fulfilled. But what does he say? The scripture might be fulfilled, saith what? I thirst. That's because of Psalm 69. So what did they do? Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the go. What did he say? What's the last thing he said? It is finished. Father, here I come. Whew. Into your hands I commend my soul. He said what? It is finished. When he utters, it is finished. Finished. Is it finished? Or is there still stuff left out there to be done? No, it's finished. The redemptive work is done. When he said it is finished, he meant it was finished. All the suffering, all the cutting, all the beating that the Lord was going to go through was finished. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. He's gone through again. They've crucified him. He's looked through. By the way, he bows his head. The only time he bows his head was when he says, it's finished and gives up the ghost. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. 
three hours of darkness. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, what did he say? It is finished. Did what? Yielded up the ghost. Now, look at what happened there in verse 45 and 46. Darkness is covered. There's a solar darkness. But then there's also a darkness in the spiritual side. And when the Lord cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That takes the reader back to Psalms 22. Let's run to Psalms 22. It takes you and I back to Psalms 22. And Psalms 22, verse 1 is the quote, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Boy, he's had an intimate relationship with the Father. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. First thing out of his mouth on the cross. Then he says, he goes into that hour of darkness, that hour of darkness where he's contending with the adversary over the souls of man. There's a great song that's sung out there called, It Is Finished. And it talks about the battle on the cross and the raging battle and the fact that the souls of men hang in the balance, the song says. And he goes in and he cries, My God, my God. He's talk- Psalms 22, the whole, the first 21 verses are talking about what's going on on Calvary, on the cross, and the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ as he goes through. And he looks in there and he says, why, why are thou so far from helping me? You used to be right here. We communed. I prayed to you every day. We had an intimate relationship. And now you're way over there. Look at what he's, verse 2. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I'm not silent, but thou art holy. O oh, thou that inhabitant the praises. You know why? He says, my God, why are you so far away? And he goes, I know why, because you're a holy God, and you can't look on sin. And I've been made sin. Watch him. Our fathers trusted in thee, and they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Then they cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Look at that. He's hanging there. He's just had a lifetime on earth as man. the, The disciples come to him and say, Teach us to pray. Like John the Baptist guys pray, teach us to pray. So he teaches them to pray. And you know how he taught them to pray? He demonstrated what it was to pray to the Father. I have an intimate relationship. But on Calvary, in those hours of darkness, he says, you know what? I'm a worm. And no man. And that worm is a descriptive term of the degenerative form of the human soul that takes on because of sin and because of death. Sin brings death. It doesn't bring life and liberty. But the human soul takes on this form of a worm. Think about a maggot. Not the best thing to think about before lunch, is it? (laughs) But that's what he is. That's what he has become. Mark chapter 9 over there, he says, hey, you're going to cut off your hand. It's rather better to go into the kingdom one-handed than with two going where? Into hell, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Look at what he's doing. Isaiah 53, we were there just a minute ago. His soul was offered an offering for sin. Revelation 20, verse 14, he talks about hell and the lake of fire and the second death. Come over to Hebrews 12. Calvary, 
when Christ goes to Calvary, he goes because he willingly chose to do the word of the Father. Because the word of the Father was, you go do this, and I will do that. And when those angels look at the ladies, when they come to the tomb, Hebrews 12, and they say, he is not here. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. The Father said, I won't leave you. The holy ones will not see corruption. He's going to be resurrected. So the Lord takes on your second death. If you trusted Christ as your Savior, he took your second death in that moment of darkness on, on the cross. And when he said, it is finished, not only is it is finished and all the scriptures are fulfilled, but the sin payment for man is done. And it's now going to be made available, we learn from Paul, to everybody, simply by faith. And when you trust that, you know what he did? He took your death. You'll never experience that. You'll never have to go through the wrenching. By the way, you read Psalms 22. Read Psalm 69 when he talks about what it is to go down into hell. into Not hell, sorry, death. And it's like a free fall. I've never jumped off a bridge with a rope tied to my ankle. I thought that was foolish. I still think it's foolish. Just like I've never jumped out of a perfectly good airplane with a backpack on my back, okay? Now, I know guys who do it, and I got it. I'm cool, but not me. I'll say right here, thank you very much. But you know what? I could only imagine what it would to be falling free, to constantly be falling with no end and to be drowning in a drowning. The son comes and he says, you know what, I'm going to show, I'm going to be in a fashion like a man. I'm going to show man what they should be about. What should man be doing? Obeying the word of the father. And what's the word of the father to you and I today? It's been given to us through the apostle Paul, Romans to Philemon. Let's go do that. Paul calls that the faith of the son of man. Galatians 2.20 hangs on the back wall. Why? The faith of the Son of the faith, His faith resting in the Word of God. Now look at Hebrews 12, and look at verse 2. Again, Hebrews is written to Hebrews, I know, but the verse says the sentiment. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the what? The joy that was set before Him. What did He do? Went to the ball game. Went over and had barbecue. Um, it's hungry time, okay? He did what? He endured the what? The cross. Despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. Come back to Philippians 2. When Jesus Christ left heaven's glory to come right on time, to be made of a woman, to be made under the law, to have an earthly ministry, to go and do for Israel what Israel needed done by her Messiah, and to be and to do. He did it by the word, on the basis of the word of the Father. Then when he reaches over and he talks to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus, and then he begins to reveal the mystery truths, the sound doctrines for the church, the body of Christ, about the heavenly places. He's doing that based on the word and the will of the Father. But he's doing it from the position of verse 2, Philippians 2, 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be what? He had the same mindset as the Father. Having the same love. What was the love of the Father? The love of the Father was the love of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what was the Son's love? The love of the Father and the love... They just... Interaction. Being of one accord. No division. No schism. 
No doubt in the father's mind that the son would never go do because the son gave his word. He'll go do it. I don't have to worry about it. The son never looked and said, okay, father, are you sure you're going to resurrect me? He goes, no, I got the word of the father on it. He'll never, he won't disappoint. Of one mind. What's the mindset? Ephesians 1, we'll be done. Ephesians 1. What's the mindset? Verse 9 and 10. Ephesians 1, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The his here, verse 3, is the Father's will. So if he's made known unto us the mystery of the Father's will, his will, then guess what the will of God is? No longer a mystery. According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What's the purpose? The purpose is to have a, a redeemed people, a redeemed people group called the church, the body of Christ, take care of the heavenly places. To have a redeemed people group called Israel, the Israel of God. He calls them the little flock, the believing remnant, the righteous nation, the royal priesthood, to take care of the earth, to bring all of that back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that glorifies the Godhead as a totality. None of that would have ever happened if he wasn't what? Made of a woman. If he never came. Could God have done it anyway? Yeah, but it would have violated about 15 scriptures. It had to come the right way, and he did. He had to come right on time, come the right way, come in the right program, and he did it. And you know what? For the joy that was set before him, the joy of seeing the Father's word and will accomplished. And for you and I today, I know it's the end of the year. What's his word and will for you and I? That all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then have that truth come and live out in your life where you're at. Again, we're all human. We're all different. We all live in different stages of life. We're all in different places. Some work, some don't. Some think they do, some think they don't. Live as who you are in Christ. Okay? All right. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for the study of your word. We thank you for Calvary, for all that it accomplished for us. And we thank you that your request back for us is just a simple thank you and an appreciation of living a, and, and the living of a life of appreciation for that. And we do everything we say and do, we do for your honor and for your glory, that, me, that we may walk worthy of you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we'll stand.